Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is indeed a day that you have made and you have gathered us here in this place to worship and praise you and to hear your word proclaimed. You've also gathered us here together to be with one another. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, that we will take to heart the message from Hebrews chapter 10. It is an awesome word that your spirit has given to your servant. And we pray that you'll be with us with each and every word that I speak. Anoint my tongue to declare your praise. And let us all receive this word with joy and gladness of heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have so enjoyed studying Hebrews and the thorough explanation that we have been given about the type and shadow that God had given to his people prior to the advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus. In chapter 10 we read, For the law... Since it has only a shadow of the th good things to come and not the very image of things, can never buy the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. It's a shadow. It can't do what the true image could do. That makes sense. Verse 2 says, otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Those sacrifices, would they not have ceased to be offered if they could make people perfect? Would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins? But in them, meaning the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins a year by year. You know, when you think about it, now I know that Israel did not follow the Lord very well. They're no different than we are. We don't do such a hot job ourselves a lot of times. But for them, because of the scriptures that we have, all of their foibles are all out there for us to see. It's like all their junk is just laying out there. But is it possible that as they went through all of the ritual and the sacrifices year after year after year after year and all of the offerings, do you think that eventually the people may have started to think, isn't there something better than this? Well, of course we know that there was something better coming. God's plan all along was to move from the shadow to that which was true, the one who was going to be the good, bring the good thing that was beyond the shadow, the image itself, or as one uh, passage states, the form. You go from the shadow to the real form. A shadow is not a form, it's just a shadow. We're the form, okay? We've got form, we've got substance. Jesus had form, he had substance, he wasn't a shadow. But do you think they may have gotten to think after all those sacrifices and rituals and everything, they might have thought, isn't there more than this? Isn't there something more than just going through the motions? Of course, God did have something better. One of the things that we are taught is that the law makes us aware of the fact that we need a Savior. The law was given to the people of God by God but it was never meant to be the end-all, beat-all. It was meant to point to our Savior. Verse 4 says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, there's a lot of therefores in this chapter. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, this is Jesus, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, 
You have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. It's interesting that, you know, you can actually pull this little passage apart and, and stick them together in this way. Not that I would do it, but it makes sense to do this. Sacrifice and offering you have not desired. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. But a body you have prepared for me. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Well, what scroll could Jesus have been talking about? Well, the scroll he's talking about is the scroll of Jesus' life. The scroll of Jesus' life was written before the foundation of the world. But it was fulfilled in the fullness of time. Paul would write, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under law. So in the fullness of time, that scroll was open because Christ, Jesus had come. And in that scroll, it had already written in there everything he was going to do. And it says, he came to do God's will. Now this is an aside, but I want you to know that every single one of us in this room, there's a scroll of our lives that was put in God's library, so to speak, before the foundation of the world for each of us. And it has only been opened up when we came to life in this earth. It's there. The scroll of our lives. Now, of course, Jesus fulfilled his purposes perfectly. We don't do it so much ourselves, do it perfectly. But we have a scroll. God has plans and purposes for us. And so it's wide open what God wants us to do. Now, he's the one leading and guiding and directing us, okay? Just like he led Jesus. But we need to, you know, keep praying that we will live out the plans and purposes that God had written in his scroll before the foundation of the earth. He says, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. It was written in the scroll of the book. It was written of him what he would do. Verse 8, after saying, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. They're offered according to the law. God put them in place. But he's not, he doesn't desire them. And he says, I, behold, I have come to do your will. Will, he takes away the first in order to establish the second. The second, you know, the second supersedes the first. The first came first, but the second, once it was in place, ended the first. What the first couldn't do with the many, many sacrifices and offerings, the second could and did by one sacrifice. The sacrifice of the body God had prepared for his son. The shadow gave way to the image. The shadow gave way to that which had form and substance. Verse 10, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. And the priest stands there all day long for that morning sacrifice, that evening sacrifice. He cannot sit down until that evening sacrifice and he's told, it's finished. Negmar. Negmar, it's finished. Then he can sit down. After Jesus had said Megmar on the cross, it says here, but he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. He was waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's, it's not that he's not doing anything, but he's waiting. He did his part for the for the redemption 
our redemption, but now he's just kicking back, so to speak, sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for his enemies to be put right under his feet. A heavenly footstool those enemies are going to become. He doesn't have to do any more for what he already did. And so he waits. He waits for the fullness of time to be full so that all that he accomplished will be finished. It's finished in the sense that it, it's done. He doesn't have to do anymore, but now it has to be finished in time. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now that's kind of an interesting verse. The Greek makes it interesting. And it was one of those where I looked up many passages, many, many translations of that. I looked up the Greek. I parsed it all. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The absolute best translation I feel I found was Eugene Peterson's The Message. And his isn't really supposed to be a translation. He just tries to do his best to explain the text in, in language people can understand. Well, in this case, I think he hit the nail on the head. And this is what he said. By that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process. Let me read that again. By that, sanctif by that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process. His work is finished, but the sanctifying process in us keeps going. We're in the process. But we're not done yet, okay? So, by one offering, he did everything needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind I will write them. No longer tablets of stone. He's going to write on our flesh. He's going to write in our hearts. He's going to write on our minds. He then says, and their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offerings, any offering for sin. No more offerings needed. Christ's one sacrifice did it all. He met all of the legal requirements. He came to fulfill legal requirements and he met them all. There isn't anybody, anywhere, any adversary that can come back and go, Jesus, on page number so-and-so of writ number whatever, you failed to do whatever. Nope. Every single legal requirement was met by the one offering. Therefore, here's another therefore. So based upon everything that I've said so far, now we're going to see what he has to say. And this really is cool because this is when you can get, you can just outline this so wonderfully. Therefore, brethren, since, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, how? By the blood of Jesus. That's, who, that's what gives us our confidence. We don't go into the holy place with our own selves. We go in by the blood of Jesus. We go in by a new and living way. Remember, he rose from the dead. A new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil. That is his flesh. His flesh was broken for us. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, we've got a therefore here. You know, since we have then let us do this. Since this, we can do this. That's what we're going to. So since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. We don't have to go in cowering before God going, oh my gosh, is he going to accept me? Is he going to accept me? Is he going to accept me? Oh Lord, are you going to accept me? 
says, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, we can draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Since we have all of this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. He's faithful. Since we have confidence, since we have a great priest, let us consider to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now this is a really, really, really good word for us. If we are at all paying attention to what's going on around us, we know that the day of Jesus' return is practically here. Okay? Now, we are going to have to go through a lot of stuff, a lot of shaking, a lot of stuff, um, tough stuff, but also awesome stuff. Because, you know, God doesn't let the devil just run rampant. God also has an answer. In the midst of all the tough stuff, there's going to be some of the greatest harvest for the kingdom of God ever in the world. That's the good stuff. But we're going to have to go through a lot of tough stuff. And so since we're going to have to still go through a lot of tough stuff before Jesus' return, we need to now already get into the habit of encouraging one another to remain faithfully, um, to stay in the word, to remain faithful to the Lord. We've got to encourage one another to remain in the word. We've got to encourage one another to remain faithful to the Lord. And we've got to encourage one another to remain faithful in fellowship with one another. Now, why is that important? Why in the world is fellowship with one another important? Because once, if we get separated, and we're out kind of wandering around all by ourselves, it's real easy to pick off a single target. And that's what the devil's looking for. In fellowship, as we are encouraging one another in this Christian faith to walk faithfully, in this word and in this faith, there is, there is strength and encouragement and power in numbers. It's wonderful. This next part, we've kind of heard before already in Hebrews. It says, for if we go on sinning willfully, and that's the big word here, willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Jesus did it once and for all. He's not going back to do it again. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace. Yikes! But if we sin willfully, that's what we're doing. We're trampling underfoot the Son of God, regarding as unclean the blood of his sacrifice, that covenant by which we were sanctified, and and we've insulted the Holy Spirit if we just keep sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning. For we know him who says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. David had a choice at one point. The Lord gave him three choices as to what kind of punishment he would face for counting the number of men he had in his army. He was not ever supposed to do that, but he did. And the Lord could send some sort of uh, army against him, an enemy could come in and come against him, or something else could happen, or he could just say, Lord, Whatever you will, I'll take whatever you will because you're going to be much easier on us, on me, 
It was his sin, not anybody else's sin. You'll be much easier on me than an enemy would. But still, I think 75,000 people died. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Peter wrote, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Judgment is going to begin with the church. It has to. Because we have been given the responsibility to be, to be the salt and the light in the earth. And the church hasn't done all that. That isn't to say that individuals in the body of Christ haven't. But you know, you take into account what the church has done uh, over the course of the last 20 years. And so much of a, there has been such a shift away from the Word of God being exactly that. The Word of God is no longer the authority in people's lives. It's now up for debate. It's now up for vote. Vote. It's like, excuse me, the Ten Commandments were never up for a vote. Jesus, I mean, Moses was given them by God. You know? Marriage isn't up for a vote either. Neither are a lot of other things. I mean, today, many in the church are saying all roads lead to heaven. Jesus isn't unique. Because of that, there are a lot of people who are going to end up in hell because the church hasn't been proclaiming the truth. And so judgment begins with the household of God. Verse 32, but remember the former days when after being enlightened, oh, this is really interesting. After being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings. He's writing to people who were Jews, remember? They became believers in Jesus. But he says, after you became enlightened, after you came to faith in Jesus Christ, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by me being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. In other words, they were treated badly for their allegiance to Jesus Christ. This next verse I've never seen before, but now to, in today's world it makes a lot of sense. He says, For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Wow. That makes sense in our day. You know, how many stories have we heard already, you know, in the Middle East where, you know, ISIS has come in and it was like, give me your car, your car or you're dead. You know, seizure of property. The choice, these people were going, have the car, I've got something better. <laughs> you know, accept joyfully the seizure of your property knowing, th knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. That's encouraging. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has such a great, which has a great reward, for you have, for you have need of endurance. What we're getting into, about to get into, will need the endurance. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet, in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, the person of faith, if he shrinks back, the Lord says, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. That's who we are. We are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. This is a powerful chapter. It's like, whoa. Wonderful words, which... You know, I would commend it to you to keep reading through this and reading through this and reading through this. Meditate upon them. Memorize them. Mark them in your Bibles. Encourage yourselves and one another uh, with these words because they are precious, precious, powerful words that we all need to hang on to, you know, as we keep moving forward in these last days before Jesus' return. Like I said, a lot of tough stuff is going to be happening before he comes. Um, and so we need, he says, for you have need of endurance. 
He was telling the people in the first century that. We live in the 21st century. We have need of that endurance encouragement too. So Lord, help us as we continue to walk forward in these days. Help us to endure the trials that will come our way. Give us the confidence we need to remain faithful to you. Enable us to always look forward and never back, no matter what may come our way. Thank you for this word from Hebrews chapter 10. Thank you for including it in the Bible. We bless you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.